So, Your Holiness, we're very happy to see you and thank you everyone for being present. This morning, Elka covered uh, the current psychological understanding of, uh, and also issues, of moving from motivation to action and the challenges that uh, we face as um, you know, we're in this global and also local dilemma. Um, mine and life, uh, our, our committee, um, wanted uh, Jimpa to actually um, go into this question from the Buddhist perspective and um, to, to see what it means from the Buddhist point of view of moving from a base of aspiration, of, of compassionate or of uh, altruistic aspiration, to engagement, uh, to actually engaging in social and environmental transformation. And so Jimpa will cover this topic and he is going to be, um, of course, uh, referencing most of his, his uh, insights from the Nalanda tradition. Uh, you know this, Your Holiness, but I'm just saying this for the benefit of uh, everyone else. Um, Jimpa was trained in, classical t in the classical Tibetan monastic system. And uh, then um, he became a father. <laughs> <laughs> No, you got married. Some things happened in between. <laughs> and we loved hearing about your kids in the trash can, so to speak, but never mind. So, but um, in the meantime, he's become your translator uh, in very frequent meetings, and he's also translated many uh, Tibetan texts, which has been, you know, very important for monastics and Westerners both. He's also an executive member of the Stanford Neuroscience Institute, a visiting scholar of sea care, an adjunct professor uh, at McGill, and he is the new uh, board chair of the Mind and Life Institute. And that starts in January, and we're so uh, grateful that you chose to do this, Jimpa. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Your Holiness, uh, at the beginning, uh, I would like to ask your permission and allow me to set, step outside my traditional role as your interpreter at these important Mind and Life gatherings. Uh, as Roshi John um, uh, said that um, uh, Mind and Life community, and particularly the two coordinators for this meeting, um, Dan and, and John, um, insisted that I <laughs> make this presentation. So, um, and for the benefit of the, uh, the audience, um, you know, during the presentation, of course, I'll be speaking in my own voice. And once the presentation is over, I'll switch back to my role as the traditional interpreter so that I could serve His Holiness in the role that I'm most comfortable with. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, um, you know, one big difference between my presentation and all the preceding presentations is that uh, um, I'm not making presentations to His Holiness, uh, although I do feel like, uh, as a student of His Holiness, that I'm, in a way, kind of present making presentations to you, as if I'm sitting down for an examination <laughs> in front of a master. <laughs> but um, but the difference is, I'll be pr my pr presentation is primarily targeted to you, primarily the scientists and the scholars who are the speakers, the main participants here, and of course the audience, and to some extent to my monastic, um, I cannot say to my monastic colleagues, I'm not a member of the mon monastic community at all, but given my background, um, addressed to them as well. Uh, of course, as uh, Roshi um, you know, made, uh, observed in the introductory commentary, um, this question of how do we move from uh, a set of belief and motivation then to action and to a behavior change at the individual level, is a question that, uh, you know, it's not just contemporary Western psychology alone that has thought about it. This is a question that has, to some extent, been thought quite seriously by most of the philosophical traditions and contemplative traditions as well. And particularly in the Buddhist tradition, this has been a major focus of interest. Um, and this is because uh, in Buddhist tradition, um, right from the beginning, uh, the idea of spiritual liberation has been understood in terms of kind of training, purification of the mind of its toxin aspects, and training of the mind and perfecting the qualities that are naturally present in our mind. So 
the whole process of that has been conceptualized and even used, conceptualized in the form of a journey, a spiritual journey, and the term we use is the, you know, traveling on the path. You know, so there was this concept of uh, a journey and traveling on the path, and part of that concept involves inevitably uh, a, a strong belief in the possibility of change and transformation. So then, uh, if that is the I question... Think basically, yeah. uh, according ancient Indian tradition, of course, theistic uh, tradition, non-theistic tradition, among non-theistic tradition, uh, the, I think more significant uh, is uh, the Jainism and the Buddhism. Buddhism. Uh, we both, you see, that so our sort of the uh, our concept is law of causality. Uh, uh, so, the uh, of suffering, of course, many levels of suffering. Uh, suffering is due to our wrong action. A wrong action due to r wrong motivation, ultimately ignorance. So now in order to way to overcome suffering, uh, the, so the, uh, the only thing is remove our ignorance. Uh, so now since the ultimate source of suffering is ignorance, and ultimate source of sort of uh, the, uh, permanent sort of uh, the, happiness. Uh, happiness is ultimately related with wisdom. So both are uh, mental part. Mental. So mind becomes very, very, very important. important. And the only way to overcome suffering is training of mind. Mental. So um, thank you, Your Holiness. And uh, so what I would like to do is to begin with the kind of the big uh, as proposal of a conceptual framework in which um, classical Buddhist tradition tries to understand this whole mechanism of change and transformation. And here, um, so, and, and generally this is kind of always spoken together as a kind of a trio of three things, view, meditation, and action, tagum jusum. But view, meditation, and action is kind of a, a shorthand to really try to put in simple terms within a large umbrella uh, what is essentially a very complex processes and mechanism. So the first part is referred to as view, and for the benefit of uh, my, my monastic members, I have now that we, these days we have Unicode on computer, it's very easy to type Tibetan. Mm. I have put the Tibetan in, which is partly out of empathy for an interpreter and because of my own profession as an interpreter, I have put in the Tibetan term so that he doesn't have to struggle thinking which Tibetan term he's using. So the view, uh, which could also oh, be... Yeah. Again. <laughs> Interfer interfering. Right. Oh. Interfering. Mm -hmm. uh, uh. Now mind is the key factor. Uh. Uh, so within mind, uh, we must make distinction sensorial level mind and the, because the it, uh, more thought level uh, thought level the uh, ignorance both ignorance and wisdom uh, not on sensory level only the and mental the, level mm. so sensory level so the view the concept of view does not apply at the level of the senses oh uh, so it is, I think, uh, our last several decades, sort of our discussion with modern scientists. There's still, you see, the, in the scientific sort of, sort of world, no distinction. There doesn't seem to be a clear systematic distinction drawn between sensory versus non-sensory modalities, uh, uh, like f uh, conceptual and non-conceptual modalities. Uh, so the sensory level of mind also rather is complicated, but the mental level is even more complicated. More complicated no. mm -hmm. So now we are mainly when we use the training of mind, not sensorial, 
sharpening our eyes, not that way. <laughs> the sensory level, did it? Much depend on physical part. So it's just some sort of the because of the the hearing aids, like glass or something, 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 something. Then no, too much use of the in a mission. At this point, he's only saying he, he's not quite sure whether there are any sensory devices that would enhance our smelling capacity. <laughs> <laughs> that, that I don't know. So these are senses, these consciousness or mind, you see, sensory level, so some way is based on physical part. Uh, so here, because these sort of mind depend on physical part, so the development also limited. Now we are mainly talking about that is the mental level. Mental level. So to continue, um, so in this package that I, we refer to as view or outlook, Tawa, really can include a lot. So this is really, the, in some sense, if we think in linear terms, this is the first stage. Um, so this would include understanding the nature of reality, which is more cognitive, using intelligence, and then you have, based on that, adopting some kind of outlook, which is the way in which you see the world. And this is where, you know, uh, Sally was talking about the importance of view and world view. And then, based upon this understanding, then you have certain attitudes that you develop towards the world and others. And derived from this, then one will have aspirations and values. So this, this whole kind of, you know, although we may use a short term like view, you know, it refers to a whole set of processes. So this is really one area which is very important. The second area uh, which is very important part of that process is again referred to in a shorthand like meditation. And of course when I use the term meditation I'm using an English term to translate uh, a Sanskrit and a Tibetan term. And the Sanskrit term is bhavna which has a connotation to become, to cultivate, to make it. Um, whereas the Tibetan term has the connota uh, connotation of cultivating familiarity, familiarization. So uh, for in plain English, I mean to really kind of be more uh, uh, liberal in the interpretation, this is essentially referring to a process that is directed to habit formation. So, um, so through constant way of learning, a particular way of thinking, way of seeing, way of experiencing, you acquire habit. So this can be seen as kind of using computer language. It's like kind of processing. And we could say this is what allows the knowledge at the intellectual level to become internalized, to be integrated through cultivation of both the wisdom component, intelligence, discernment, insight on the one side, and the more effective motivational component like compassion and so on on the other. So in other words, we can look at it including both the effective stance that we learn to acquire and a value stance in relation to the world. So, so in, in some sense, this is the classical Buddhist response to the perennial Greek question. You know, Sally uh, referred to the Greek idea that to know good is to do good. But clearly there have been a lot of problems. You know, someone may know that smoking is bad for his health, but may continue to smoke. So then the question is, why is there is a gulf between the knowing something and not doing it? And Buddhist, classical Buddhist, and maybe Indian tradition on the whole would argue that that knowledge has not been internalized through some kind of cultivation. So in knowledge on the intellectual level alone is not good. So this would be the Buddhist response to that question, whereas the Greek, of course, have talked about the weakness of the will, akresia, and so on. Then, ideally, you know, once you have formed this kind of habit through internalization and integration, then the idea, ideal would be to engage in action kind of naturally coming f out of that transformed states of mind. So that's why, you know, when um, Claire talked about ethics, one, the, one of the points that I raised was that in some sense, if you look at the Western ethical traditions, the Buddhist approach to ethics is much closer to the spirit of virtuous ethics, where the focus is not so much on un uncovering rules or particular action per se, but it's more on the development of the character of the individual. So the idea is that people will act naturally, ethically, out of that kind of developed character. So this is very much in line with Buddhist 
way of thinking, and, and this is the... So this is a broad conceptual kind of map, which I think, although comes from the Nalanda tradition, but I think it is applicable. I mean, there is nothing specifically religious about this, mm. you know, model, and it may also help, you know, theorists to look at relationship between, you know, intellectual state of knowing and how th can one can translate that into you know, a specific action. Now, the question is, of course, this is an ideal, you know, before we internalize and integrate our knowledge and value system into our very being so that we act naturally in the world coming out of it, there is a long, you know, uh, period. So then the question is, how do we act on a day-to-day -day basis when confronted with various ethical challenges, whether it is in relation to environmental issues or uh, whatever? So here I'll be drawing primarily from the writing of uh, a great Nalanda teacher whose influence on the Tibetan tradition is huge, and His Holiness actually uh, referred to this great master, Shantideva, uh, whose uh, text, um, Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, His Holiness mentioned how he's receiving teachings on that from Kunulama Rinpoche, really had a radical uh, impact on his own personal thinking. So I'll be drawing primarily from this 8th century uh, Buddhist uh, master. And by the way, I think the Thanka painting of Shantideva is just behind that door I checked. So I'll be drawing from, you know, he wrote various texts, but two texts are hugely influential in the Tibetan uh, tradition, uh, Nalanda tradition. One is the Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life. The other one is called Compendium of Training. So for the benefit of the Tibetan uh, you know, participants here, I've put in the Tibetan citation. The Yor Chumro. So His Holiness is, you know, reminding me that uh, Shantideva's influence is primarily, you know, from the point of view of the Bodhisattva activities and altruistic deeds and actions, then his influence is huge. But when it comes to the understanding the nature of reality, and the development of the old view, then the influence is primarily coming from Nagarjuna and his immediate uh, disciples. So Nagarjuna is here um, oh. behind me, yeah, and his main disciples are behind you. Um, so, no. so uh, here, um, and uh, one of the beauty of these Nalanda great masters is that they wrote extensively and they wrote in prose, which generally tends to be quite large, but they also wrote short verses that would summarize these ideas and which lend themselves to easy memorizations. Um, so here, um, of course, this, so I'll cite this first. This, he's referring to a particular activity. This is, uh, and he's here he's referring to how to learn to avoid engaging, indulging in fruit, fruitless activity. That, that are essentially harmful. And he says, this is accomplished through constant mindfulness. And then mindfulness comes from a deep dedication. As for dedication, it arises from knowing the benefits of tranquility and striving for it. So you can already see that there are kind of a causal connections being made between these various mental kind of factors, processes. Um, so what... Shantideva is pointing out here is that on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, the key to really living an ethical life is to really bring to awareness what your value system is and what your aspirations are. And this connects very beautifully with uh, Elger's point that coming from contemporary psychology research, that what is important is to keep the intention active and keep the goals active. So this is exactly what Shandideva is pointing out here, we need to learn to have constant mindfulness in the face of everyday kind of challenges. But then the question is, where does this kind of constant mindfulness come from? And then he says it comes from a deep dedication to that particular pursuit. So here, um, you know, Sally talked about deep awareness. And here, in some sense, this is somewhat similar. Um, it, you know, Shandideva is talking about you know, coming from Shindu Kuba, which is a really not just a simple respect, but a form of a deep commitment and deep dedication. 
And then the question is, where does that kind of dedication come from? He says, well, that comes from actually knowing the benefits of that particular pursuit, and particularly in the form of tranquility and peace and happiness and joy that will arise from pursuing a particular line of uh, course of action and then striving for it. And then there is a beautiful um, you know, passage where he immediately identifies what he means by dedication here. He says, now as for dedication, this refers to turning your mind towards the concerned activities from deep within. So it's like it, there is a kind of a, a, you know, a character development, a, a value system shift, so that you know, not only do you turn your attention to it, but there is a very strong effective you know, engagement with this particular pursuit. And then he says, it is an antidote. This is an antidote against carelessness and negligence. So this kind of deep dedication is the best antidote to dealing with carelessness and, and negligence. So then, of course, since bringing to awareness, you know, mindfulness, one's values and aspirations become so important, then is deep dedication the only source of such constant mindfulness? Here the, I will cite from Shantideva's other text. He acknowledges there are other ways of bringing that mindfulness to, you know, to the conscious level. And this is from his other text. And here uh, you can see he says that uh, mindfulness comes easily through, then he lists them, associating with one's spiritual mentor. So this kind of you know, peer group in which you kind of you know, associate with is very important. So you know, it shows how environmental influence can be a powerful factor. Um, so for the monastic members, of course, he's primarily thinking about the monastic members, then associating with the right kind of people is very important. And also those who are familiar with Tibetan Buddhist practice you know, instructions, there's very important emphasis is placed on what is called, you know, um, uh, associating with the right kind of companions, um, company. And then another thing that he lists is through the instruction of one's preceptors. So the first one is just kind of writing, being part of a right kind of community. The second one deals with specific instructions from one's teachers. And then he lists also fear as a powerful motivating factor through fear. So this ties to the discussion we had about the role of negative emotions as a motivating factor. And then I would argue that he's... According, according Buddhist or psychology, or I don't know, uh, about mind. Uh, the one mind, like fear, uh, there are variety due to uh, other sort of minds. Factors, no? Mm? Factors. Oh. Now, some fear. There is real sort of reasons to be to be fear. To be afraid. Oh. Uh, uh, that fear is right. Uh, and sometimes you see fear, actually, kasori, uh, no base. No base. No. That's of course just because of the unnecessary trouble. Uh, the other fear is necessary. That brings precaution. Right. Uh, uh, then like ang and also anger, combined with compassion, combined with sense of concern of others' well-being. With that, with that sort of, because of the mind, uh, and anger, positive. That anger brings more energy, essentially positive, Benefit, beneficial energy. energy no. uh, jealousy, uh, hatred, and with, with that, you see, anger, that's a negative. Then, similarly, equal, feeling of I, strong self. The strong self, which bring more enthusiasm to do some positive thing. That kind of egoistic sort of attitude is right, positive. Another sort of this feeling of sense of self. sense of strong self, self, which you see lead bully other or harm other, exploit others, or exploit other, cheating other, 
that kind of sort of the strong sense of strong self is negative. So mind still lives in it. Could you want to change the positive negative self? Could you want to change the negative self? Could you want to change the negative self? Could you want to change the negative self? So uh, His Holiness is making the point that when we are talking about mental processes, we are talking about very, very complex phenomena. So we cannot really pinpoint the particular mental factor and say this is positive or this is negative. You know, we have to take into account its function in a given context and the, you know, many other factors that are part of that process. Uh, so we cannot really kind of make a categorical judgment that say, you know, strong sense of self is wrong or strong sense of self is right. 아, 그래서 미도버스를 뒤에 참아라고 배 이거 잘 지도가. 다들스. 다들스는 림보모 시우스도가. 림보모 시우스도가. So similarly for example and these days a lot of people in their enthusiasm for meditation uh, you know values a state of thoughtlessness. But again, you know, it may sound simple but there are many different levels of thoughtlessness. Uh, sometimes I jokingly telling is there some rapid no immediate danger. Their stomach full, then they also thoughtlessness sort of state of mind. <laughs> so there are variety. <laughs> so it is very very important, you see, uh, to know one thing. We have to look all the so different angles. Oh, angles. Otherwise, you see, there are. <laughs> so otherwise, there would be always the temptation to go to that extreme of, you know, which is always give the example, taking one grain of, uh, in one grain and then trying to argue that all the grains must exactly be the same. <laughs> so, uh, of course, Shantideva acknowledges that fear can be an important motivating factor. Um, and then uh, finally he lists, and which I would argue is his favorite, um, favorite kind of, you know, source of mindfulness, which is then he says, to the fortunate who are dedicated. So he refers to the people who have deep dedication to be f the fortunate ones, because in them mindfulness will arise quite easily. So what we see here is a kind of, a, you know, of course I'm being very, very crude in my kind of, you know, presentation of the complex mental processes, but I think I personally find this kind of delineation and unpacking of this process from belief and knowledge to actual action, you know, at least in my own personal life, very beneficial. Now, of course, we all know, and, and Elke pointed that out particularly very, very powerfully, that human beings are very, very complex beings with all sorts of competing you know, values and mental processes operating at the same time. And also, uh, together with that, there are also many other, you know, factors that are very part of our psychology, one of which is the basic laziness. You know, Elke, Elke actually gave an interesting example of how one can turn that laziness into a kind of an opportunity. But laziness has been a major uh, question for the Buddhist, uh, you know, psychologist uh, like Shantideva and others. And uh, so, um, one thing that I thought I could share with the, the scientists and the philosophers uh, and contemplative scholars here is a particular kind of classical Indian Buddhist take on how to deal with the problem of laziness. Um, and first of all, and this, this kind of idea uh, originally comes, not originally, but more systematically developed in uh, Asanga mm -hmm. and his brother Vasubandhu's writings. They are fourth century uh, great Indian Nalanda masters. And both of them, uh, interestingly, come from the Peshawar region, which is modern day Pakistan. So uh, in, in, in the classical Buddhist uh, psychology, uh, we unpack laziness into various components or aspects. You have laziness in the form of just simple procrastination. I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow. And this is probably the, one of the most common ones that we are all familiar with. And, uh, you know, of course, I know from my own personal experience, this is, uh, this is something that is, is a close friend to all of us. 
And then the other one, the second one, is a, a very interesting concept. And normally we won't associate this with a kind of a laziness. And this is referred to as habitual intelligence, indulgence in contrary behavior. So, um, and we wouldn't normally see this as kind of a laziness in contemporary psychology, but it is, you can see that as a form of laziness because it's a kind of avoidance. It's a form of laziness in the form of avoidance. And then finally, uh, the other important laziness is, you know, is, is a being discouraged. And sometimes this form of laziness is referred to as Danila Nyeba, means kind of almost like kind of insulting oneself, an insult to oneself. So this is where kind of, you know, lack of confidence and, you know, kind of really having a much lower esteem to one's own capacity. So this is also seen as an uh, a laziness uh, because it prevents us from acting out. And then the, the remedies or the antidotes that these great Buddhist masters suggest to counter them, uh, one of them is teba, is shraddha, but it's, it's, it's a very complex term which often is translated as faith, but probably the faith is the wrong word here. It is admiration, it is confidence, it is trust. Mm -hmm. It has both cognitive as well as effective you know, dimension. So we will use this as, you know, I have tepa in my teacher, um, is, which is not a cognitive sense. It's like kind of a, a sense of entrustment. You know, I entrust myself to the guidance of my teacher. So that's one important factor. The second one is aspiration, that you would want to have, you know, strong aspiration. And third is effort. And the fourth one is interesting. It's suppleness, but also has a very strong component of joy. And this concept of joy as a counterforce to laziness, joy as a motivating factor, is a very important concept that runs through the writings of many great Indian Buddhist masters, including the great Nalanda masters. And, and this, I think, is an, a, an idea that I think contemporary psychology particularly scientists of science of behavior, could really take into account. Because we know from our experience of being parents that when we are trying, struggling to teach our children to take one instrument, like one of my daughters played piano and the other one violin, initially it's a it's hard job, you know, taking them to the classes. Of course, I don't. Sophie, my wife drives. And then, you know, we would want them to take one sport and initially, it is a lot of hard work. But once they get to a point where they take pleasure in it, then we know from our experience, then the, it's much easier for them to ask them to do something. And same thing goes for studies. If a child takes joy in study, then it's much easier for that child to really do the homework and stuff. So the joy has clearly an important role to play. But joy need not necessarily be, and here we talked about the power of positive emotions associated with, you know, pursuit and ideas. But here we should not confine our concept of joy in a very simple terms, because people can learn to take joy in something they may, that may be hard, but because of the value system. So the athletes take great joy you know, in what they do, because they value winning, they value that particular thing that they do, and it's this value, the strong value that you accord on a particular pursuit when you accomplish something. You have a deep sense of joy, and those kind of sense of joy is really cultivated sense of joy, but once you have the value in, incorporated into your being and your aspirations are so strong, then the joy comes through the, you know, the pursuit through the pursuit. And I think this is an important insight coming from the classical Indian Buddhist and Tibetan tradition that we need to look seriously into and which could have implications in the way in which we design things, curriculum and so on for teach, you know, children. And His Holiness talked about uh, you know, potential benefits of adapting you know, Tibetan monastic debate style. And the reason why this is that you can see if, if you can observe monks debating, one of the important, interesting, immediate observations is that it's very joyful. You know, people are laughing, people, it's very physical, it's animated, and so you can see how... Not joy, always. Not always. <laughs> Sometimes, even you see the one... one one Debaters. No. Huh? Debaters. Oh, may lose temper. That's true. <laughs>
So, so finally, um, I'll just summarize what I have said here um, in this kind of crude, um, you know, I, my own training is in humanities, philosophy and religion, and we are not used to using PowerPoints with nice charts and stuff. So I'm Orly. slowly learning yeah. how to use this. And uh, so to sum up, you know, the insights coming from the uh, Nalanda Indian and Buddhist tradition, we see these are the kind of steps. So you begin with awareness, and His Holiness always emphasizes awareness. But awareness has to be deep, and that kind of awareness comes from weighing the pros and cons, cost-benefit analysis. So initially, uh, the role of cogn cognition and intelligence and discernment plays a very important role. And then based on that awareness, then you learn to admire it. You learn to, once you have admiration, then you will aspire it. And on the basis of aspiration, then you learn to develop confidence and deep dedication that we spoke about, which will then lead to more effort and joy and enthusiasm on your part, which will then allow you to make that pursuit and goal and intention active in your mind, and which hopefully will then lead to action. So um, we, uh, Elke talked about how we use different mechanisms to move from, you know, motivation to action. Sometimes rules are more effective, and you know, Buddhist tradition. Uh, would acknowledge that because, you know, although the importance of discernment and insight and intelligence is so crucial in this kind of process, but when it comes to dealing with the life on a day-to-day -day basis, the ideal is always to be able to respond immediately by being able to bring to mind whatever your value and what your aspirations are. So I would argue that... Uh, the role of intelligence and insight and wisdom seems to be very crucial in the cultivation of those kind of values and how we see ourselves, what kind of things we value. And here there are important implications for teaching those kind of values very early in children. His Holiness gave the example of how Tibetan children instinctively avoid stepping on bugs. That's a culturally acquired value. And once you have internalized that value, then the behavior comes very naturally. I mean, Tibetans would immediately cringe when someone steps on a bug. I mean, so this is a culturally acquired value. So once you have internalized value, so before you internalized for grown-ups, I think it is, of course, the role of intelligence and discernment and pros, weighing the pros and cons become very important. But later on, when confronted with actual ethical dilemma, when there are competing values, you know, in a given situation, then again, the role of intelligence and wisdom become very, very crucial because we have no way of adjudicating. But in most of our lives, ideal scenario would be to be able to draw from our value system and aspirations and act naturally in the best possible way to a given situation. And these are things which I think um, you know, I have personally found very beneficial. And also, at the beginner's stage, you know, all the great Buddhist masters of Indian Nalanda tradition and the Tibetan masters as well always emphasize the importance of environment. So, for example, for the monastics, a great emphasis is placed on avoiding situations where you might be confronted with the possibility of breaking a vow. So creating the right kind of environment seems to be very important because there's a beautiful line in Asang Avasubandhu's text where he says that uh, those of us who haven't gotten rid of our strong emotional afflictions, if we are confronted with proximity of a temptation, and then we are likely to project qualities of attractiveness and desire, then of course we are going to act in, a, in an afflicted manner. So these kind of insights suggest that you know, there's a role both for the individual to take you know, measures to transform his or her mind, but also to seek some kind of environmental changes so that the person is protected from in a, finding himself or herself in a situation one would act in a negative manner. And, and here, I mean, one, you know, we talked about voluntary simplicity or voluntary poverty. Uh, and I, one thing that people in the West, in the consumerist culture, where I'm living, I've been living for tw almost 20 years now, is that they don't, 
they tend, people tend to look at simplicity always in negative terms of lacking something, depriving of something. But actually, simplicity frees you. For example, if a family has two cars, then you have all sorts of things that comes with two cars. You have the bills to pay for two cars, the insurance to pay for two cars, all the paperwork, and all of this, and then the garage space, and then the parking. Whereas if there's only one car, then th the question is, there would be times when there would be conflict. Then you take a taxi or a public transportation, and it maybe ex you know, exert a little bit of inconvenience, but economically also, that's a much cheaper and efficient way of dealing with the question of getting a second car. So people tend to kind of you know, forget that simplicity actually can lead to greater quality of life. So I think those kind of things uh, are, I think, important. And these are, as Sally pointed out, that Long one thing... Longjardy. No. Uh, no. So there is a, actually His Holiness was reminding me that there is a beautiful uh, line from the, uh, one of the Kadamba masters. He says that uh, in the in the in the room or in the home of a person who is contented, uh, a truly rich person is sleeping, and uh, uh, that's mentally very rich, contented, oh, very happy, so very peacefully, restful. And then, he's, then he says that, uh, but the greedy does not recognize this. <laughs> um. So sometimes I, uh, some my close friend, some businessman, I usually is teasing them, you are a slave of money. Always running, 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 running. One time I was in Moscow. So one, uh, one Russian uh, uh, who helped sort of my sort of, sort of accommodations. Where no, yeah. it? No, no. Uh, host. So he told me he have to go to San, Fr San Francisco or Los Angeles. I think uh, 16, 18 hours from flight. Moscow car flight. flight no. mm. And remain there two, three hours, and then return. Difficult uh, for money, you see, they sacrifice see, this guy was sort of <laughs> so it's truly, it's very true what this Kadamba master said. Um, so to summarize, um, my main point is that, um, um, you know, looking at the insights coming from the contemporary psychology, science of behavior, and also from the Buddhist psychology, uh, clearly there are, you know, it's not, Kind of, uh, I mean, there are stages in the mental processes that goes from knowing to action, where people can take more proactive approaches to really kind of transform their, you know, value system and aspiration. And on the level of each individual, and they can all, you know, we can each of us can really make a difference. And, and it, which was a, a theme that has been constantly coming up in this um, meeting. Thank you. I'll now step back to my <laughs> <laughs> traditional role. Yeah. So we'd love to hear any comments. Any comments or questions? Mathieu. <coughs> to connect that with uh, some of kind of the dilemma that we had this morning about reconciliating, presenting the full picture of suffering and also having a, a positive um, sort of view of things. And I think this relates perfectly well with what you said and the concept of the Four Noble Truth. So there was a kind of seemingly contradiction this morning. Should we insist on the aspect of suffering, the negative aspect, the what even goes wrong and everything? And as John has pointed out, if we don't fully assess uh, the suffering and its, and its cause, then uh, we will not be able to take the proper measures. Mm -hmm. But then if we stop there, say that's the first noble truth, 
so maybe we can understand the causes as well, uh, but still we are not out of trouble. So if we stop there, then we adopt a very pessimistic outlook, it means it's hopeless, uh, everything is bad, it's not only going to go wrong and we are going to go down and that's it. So as his honest one said, I remember very well, he's saying in that case, don't bother to think about suffering is exaggerating your torments, go to the beach and drink a good beer. But now if the turnable truth comes in, there is a solution, there's a possibility. And that possibility is what gives the positive image. But unless you know the full characteristics of the, of the suffering, and then, of course, uh, the, uh, the is, is sort of, you would not know how to apply or, or, or actualize the potential uh, for the actualization of removing the suffering. So then it comes to the notion of joy, because once you know that there is a possibility of removing suffering, then optimism is there will be a solution, there is a potential, even the circumstance looks bad, there are many causes and conditions involved, and then we can get out of trouble. So the methods, the fourth noble truth, come into the picture. So not to be a pessimistic is not to say that the bad aspects are intrinsic, and we are hopeless, and I am hopeless, and there's no solution. So you will never have the courage, the joyful effort, or the virtuous joy to engage in the solution. But if you know the full picture, that there are certainly problems, there are, those causes can be identified, and the potential for removing, then the methods come. So it becomes a much fuller picture, and we can combine very well, presenting the negative aspect of the situation with a very encouraging aspect of the potential for solution. So that sort of integrates also the yeah. Four Noble Truth. Yeah. That's great. Th thank you, Monty. That was very, very cogent, helpful. Um, Elka, I wonder if you have some reflections. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, I, we would really appreciate hearing your perspective on what uh, Jimpa was addressing. What resonates or doesn't resonate? One, one thing that strikes me, it's a, it's a very nice integration of these different levels of analysis you know, that uh, Western psychology also emphasizes. On the one hand, that we sort of know things analytically yeah, after very careful decomposition of the problem into its components and then reassembling it and really deeply understanding it, but with our heads. But then also the appreciation of reality through, I don't want to use the word holistic because I'm going to get into trouble, but through, <laughs> through more... Uh, <laughs> holistic but, but through more... Uh, to less analytic and maybe more association and more affect-based processes. And I think what you know, the, the Buddhist uh, approach does very nicely, it, rather than sort of saying they coexist and they maybe sort of feed into each other, it spells very nicely how they interact with each other and how, and how they go back and forth, you know, how awareness and, and cognitive processing actually can lead to an emotional experience that's positive, then can feed back into different rational analysis. Very helpful. Um, Greg. I'd just like to share that I'm, um, uh, we've, we've heard uh, several times today, His Holiness this morning uh, emphasized that there are three levels of understanding, hearing, critical reflection, and experience. And then uh, again, this afternoon, we've, we've learned that there are these two levels of mind, sensory level and then the deeper mental level. And I think it, it, I'm realizing that the, the term awareness, um, at, at least I've been translating much too shallowly. It's, 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 it's something about full, your, your, full, your full being is aware. And I'm just asking myself, I don't have the answer, but I'm asking myself how in, in, the, in the field that we work in, really, I'm, I'm echoing you, but I'm saying I feel a challenge to, to our field. We, we tend to just convey the, the, the information at the surface level. It's an eco-label that says this is a green product, or it's a computer that says this is 22 kilograms. But we're missing, uh, we're, we're missing the two levels. And so I'm just going to be asking myself, how can we communicate uh, over time. I, it, that's the other message, of course, from Buddhism is that this is, takes practice and time. So 
I'll be asking how can we cultivate practices which which deepen the awareness of both the the the, the environmental impacts of our of of our actions and the benefits that we might achieve. Mm-hmm. I think uh, our friends here, you see, you all, most cases, you see, uh, firstly, you learn from your teacher or from books, the first level of awareness. Understanding. No, understanding. understanding. Then you carry research. research work. So that is the second level. So through your own research and experiment, experiment, then the result is something always same way happen. Larry. Then develop conviction. conviction. Then decide this is true. So that's the second level. Then perhaps I think, uh, like I think those uh, the sophisticated big sort of aeroplane, the pilot in front of them, so many sort of switches. Right? Huh? If I'm there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> in aeroplane, that would drive. So you see, these, you see, they, I think the managing the way, handling yeah, yeah, these, this. without sort of thinking, automatically come. That's the robust mission. So that's the third level, when it becomes internalized and experiential, almost oh. like automatic. That means, ding ding ding, come to Jeb, 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 of course, in very, very strict technical usage of the term, sometimes the third level of understanding is also defined in terms of very high levels of concentrated power. But generally, one speaking, one now, one one generally one can also apply it to the question of being becoming habituated. So the yoga surgery. So, uh, Greg, if I understood your question uh, right correctly, you were thinking more in terms of how to communicate that with right. others, not right. just at the first level, but at the second and third. And His Holiness was saying that to move from the f- first level, which is just labeling and information driven, to the second level with relation to sharing with others, is to really kind of, you know, have some form of um, challenge that, you know, people like students studying environment of the teacher teachers now should tell them mm, this is the sort of basis then you yourself you see the analyze analyze and bring questions yeah, you know, especially and the contradictions oh huh? so they will find and then uh, you can give some kind of award right? those students who bring more questions, questions more critical questions then give some kind of award so that's the way to bring to enthusiasm. Now the president of Manguji, the Tabatan engine, the Tasatan Yamarta, that because of the search, cut it with service, the Jewish at water. So to say that uh, even in the monastic um, debating you know, environment, uh, it's not always the case that the person who is so dedicated to debating is being motivated by higher ideals like seeking you know, liberation, but rather to really put someone on the spot. <laughs> so when someone succeeds in doing so, then people say, oh, he was brilliant. He put the other guy in his place. Then people should take get a deep sense of satisfaction. <laughs> so you see student, give them some kind of opportunity, courage. Right? Right? Uh, to encourage. To enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. Huh? Enthusiasm. Uh, 
if they carry more sort of, uh, sort of analytical sort of study, study. Uh, then bring some sort of contradictions, what teacher stated. Uh, uh, then give them praise. Oh, you are, you are sort of uh, uh, I myself also, you see, uh, when I was very young, you see, my tutor always very, very uh, reserved. Uh, reserved. Uh, uh, I think s some of you already know. Uh, when I uh, initial initial level, when I study, uh, my teacher always keep a uh, whip, one whip. Mm. I usually say, uh, how joke is it? Uh, joke, or I mean, it, it, telling that that whip yellow, color yellow, yellow whip. So suppose the student, Dalai Lama, holy Lama, holy student. So whips also should be holy. So yellow, yellow whip. <laughs> but I know if the holy yellow whip use, I don't, uh, I, I know, you see, no differences, holy pain <laughs> or ordinary pain. So out of fear, I carried my study. Uh, but that, that sort of effort not come from within. But then later, gradually, later, later, you see, the, uh, my teacher prays, oh, your mind is very sharp. Oh, your memory is very good. And your ability of analyze things, very good. Then I get more enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> then effort come from within, like that. So that's, I think, everywhere are the same. So I think t the teachers, I think t something, I think much depends on the teacher's side. Teacher's skill now. And uh, the, the monastic scholars, teachers, some uh, just to explain according to text. text. Uh, those drop sort of scholars, text, they can't be lost. So even in the monasteries, you see different styles of teaching. Some t teachers generally tend to explain the text word by word. But uh, some more skilled uh, instructors, they would say, the text you can read, but then he picks out the problem, you know, the more difficult you know, points from the text, and then he debates with them and analyzes them and problematizes them. Yes. So here His Holiness was saying that he shares with the members of the monastic community that... Uh, so, so far, um, no. So even though uh, in the, the, the kind of the debating tradition is supposed to emphasize one's personal understanding and the debating techniques and reasoning, but there is of course uh, a custom to generally always cite important authorities and, and try not to go beyond the boundaries of these in, in important thinkers. So His Holiness have, uh, has expressed the wish that um, on particular subjects like uh, middle way philosophy or epistemology and uh, other topics where it's relevant, we should move away from this general practice and cite less the authority of great writer, great thinkers of the past, but more really pursue the line of inquiry, critical inquiry. Dekila. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I know. Sure, it's on? Okay. Yeah, it is. Um, so I feel very happy to see the, the phrase joy and enthusiasm because um, I think most environmental activists have this feeling that we're actually optimists pretending to be pessimists. And, um, but at the same time, in fact, very recently I read an article that said um, they're actually looking, in psychology, they're looking at a particular kind of depression that environmental activists are facing because activists are screaming out as loud as they can about the environmental problems we're facing and it often feels like nobody's listening. So there is a real um, issue of depression and exhaustion that's taking place in, among environmental activists. 
And when I, when I look at this, the Buddhist psychology of action, my question to His Holiness and to yourself, Jimpala, is when that happens, how, how do we, from a Buddhist perspective, change this feeling of exhaustion and depression? Um, I think um, from the Buddhist point of view, um, one thing that I would say is that... Um, his Holiness was um, <coughs> again citing from Shantideva, um, where he makes a very important point that before you, you know, commit yourself into a particular line of work um, and, and take on a challenge, uh, it is important on your part to really kind of evaluate that that pursuit and to see whether it is um, to your capability or not. Um, and once you are committed, then you shouldn't have second thoughts about it. But you should not just rush and, and grab onto something that it is you are not able to kind of handle. So that is one general advice that comes from Shantideva. But the other advice that His Holiness often gives is that um, you know, when we are in the heat, in the middle of some kind of pursuit, like environmental activism, and you feel so overwhelmed and nobody's listening, you feel kind of alone, then um, it is important to step out and, and take a kind of a, a wider perspective. And this is often what His Holiness uh, recommends to a lot of, in many other areas, not just environmental. Because sometimes what, we hap what happens is that when you look at a particular issue so close up, you don't see the wider picture, the context, the wider context in which, you know, this particular event or, you know, problem uh, has a role. So then you feel so overwhelmed, but simply by shifting the space from which you look at the problem can have an impact. Another thing that His Holiness quite often advises is that um, uh, people need to constantly make an effort to really uh, cultivate joy, look back in time, and His Holiness gives his own personal experience in his own spiritual development. He says that if he were to, you know, kind of look at the progress in terms of very short time frame, then there isn't much to feel joyful about. But if he compares himself to a decade ago, two decades ago, three decades ago, then there's clearly a, a tremendous room for joy. So similarly, I think with the environmental movement, um, I think one thing that probably is helpful is to take this advice and apply it, because there are many areas in which environmentalists have, been, have had tremendous success. The fact that all, most of the schools, at least in the developed countries, are, children are being taught environment, have projects about environment, is a great achievement. I mean, it's, 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 it's seeping into the wider cultural value. So these are important achievements. Uh, I think that these are the things that I would uh, suggest. I mean, of course, I'm drawing from His Holiness's advice. Yeah. Diana. Diana. Okay. Um, so while we're seeking advice and counsel on things that worry us deeply, um, I'm wondering if um, there's anything I can draw from this perspective uh, to help in conversations with people who are very skeptical about climate change. Um, and even to have them, some of those people who are very skeptical are actually taking actions like funding politicians who are not doing the right thing about climate change. So on the occasions where I have the opportunity to talk to people like that? Is there anything I can learn about how to approach somebody who would look at that graph that I show of rising temperatures and almost be in denial about it? Are, are there any lessons I can learn about converting skeptics? <laughs> <laughs>
citing from a 2nd century or maybe 2nd century um, classical Indian text um, authored by this master here, uh, Aryadeva, um, who was a student of uh, Nagarjuna. Uh, Chief, uh, uh, main student. Principal student of Nagarjuna. Senior student. Oh. Um, in his text called 400 stanzas on the middle way, uh, he talks about um, um, the skillful ways, means that are necessary on the part of the teachers when he or she is communicating certain ideas or points to a student. And one important point he raises is to take into account the sensibilities and mental disposition of the listener, the student. So adapting your message to the sensibility and mentality of the other person is a very important lesson one can learn. Yeah. My own little experience uh, when we talk with someone, uh, there may be some different views uh, and disagreement. First, uh, I consider that, I consider because of that, another human being. On the human being level, no differences. I want a happy life. He or she also is want happy life, uh, and m make closer connection. Uh, right from the beginning, your profession, their profession, something different, and a different nationality, different faith, or different races. Uh, uh, from that position, talk sometimes uh, unnecessary sort of barrier maybe there. So how to remove make use the how, how to remove uh, the barrier uh, that uh, develop there's some kind of closeness feeling uh, with that person as a hu human being uh, we both want both same goal happy life uh, now how to achieve that this is my view your view same aim, same human being. Then, then the other side automatically you see develop some kind of kasota, kasota yes. attitude, uh, more desire to find some closer ra, uh, making Brown. common effort. The right from the beginning is to talk on the on the on the basis of, sort of different differences. Um, then. Uh, a dead person uh, may love difference, and from the difference, different sort of positive, positive a defensive standpoint. Uh, defensive for that standpoint. Uh, stand, uh, then offensive. <laughs> <laughs> that no, because of no use. <laughs> that better not talk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, number of cases at the beginning. Uh, a little bit distance, and then talk and build some kind of closer sort of, because of the feeling uh, connection love. from the fundamental level. Then it becomes easier. This is my view. Mm. Wonderful. Um, Sally and uh, then John. Yeah. Is, is that a. Say what? Oh, okay. Yes, this is addressed to both of you. And um, I'm wondering what we do about the problem of superficial knowledge coming to deep awareness. And in our time now, we have so much information on the Internet, and it's very easy to find out information about everything. So people all think that somehow that the information is going to give them quick solutions. They want the solution. All right, I know things are bad. What is the answer? The sort of magic bullet. And what I hear from you folks saying 
is that we need deep knowledge, and one sees how <clears throat> in monks with um, lives of deep meditation, this could occur, this change. And I have been studying the lives of the saints for many years and have learned the same thing, that the gradual journey of spiritual development in their lives is so impressive. But then I think, what are we, how do we answer the question for most people who say, what should I do? And what they really mean is, what is the quick solution for this? When, what would the Buddhist answer be? for moving from superficial knowledge, information from the internet, to deep knowledge. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so his holiness is saying that uh, the internet uh, you have information. Um, I mean, the, the, first of all, not all informations uh, are necessarily something that we, we would want to put into practice. Um, so, uh, and then he, you know, suggested that I try to respond. Um, Looking at this question, I mean, it is a serious question uh, and challenge for um, you know those of us who live in the uh, kind of you know, on a constant information age, um, with multiple emails that are coming on a daily basis, and uh, and also with the Google and all of this just super highway of information. Um, and general kind of attitude in the West, and I would expect it to be shared by the East. Eastern societies as well is that the idea, uh, other than the, you know, of course, authoritarian societies, is that the more information is the better. But we do know that more information did not necessarily be better in the sense because we become paralyzed. And the question is, how do we, you know, find a way of dealing with this? And here again, I would go back to the great Nalanta masters and really um, kind of ask the fundamental question. What kind of value system do we want? And the, once you have sorted that out, and of course within that you would have certain priorities, and then, you know, based on that value system, you would have certain aspirations in life, and the immediate or long term. And then when you are confronted with this diluge of information, you will have a kind of a, a very shorthand way of sorting them out. You know, that's relevant, that's not relevant. That's re and you may want to indulge in certain reading for the sake of enjoyment, but for your own practical application, you will have a kind of a, a mechanism to sort those out. And, and once you internalize that mechanism, then it becomes fairly, you know, uh, quick. Because, so I think that is what I would, you know, suggest from taking from the Nalanda Master's uh, insights. Yeah. John. And then Jonathan. I think that there might even be something in your presentation, Chimpala, that might speak to this, Your Holiness. And it's actually part of the question that I wanted to ask, which is you have a, a term in there to describe the function of, of mindfulness or jampa or smriti, which is a kedusupa, that it blocks yeah. this kedusupa, which I can't remember the Sanskrit right now, but uh, that you translated as carelessness. But I think that term also has a sense of being sort of overwhelmed, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. A sense, because usually mindfulness is described as that which prevents distraction, so that the mind does not go off to a distractor. But what's s interesting about that term, if I'm getting it right, and I'd love to hear your comment or His Holiness's comment about this, but I think the implication of that term when you say here the Subra is actually not that there's a hook in the distractor, so to speak, that it is something that is really actively pulling the mind away something is becoming salient and one yeah. is losing track of one's main point, one's main goal, 
In other words, instead of keeping the eyes on the prize, as you sometimes hear in American English, one is now distracted onto something else. And I think what, that, what it's saying here in terms of this pattern is that the role of mindfulness, uh, in this, this version of my, mindfulness, this style of mindfulness, is to prevent that kind of scattering, yeah. a sort of scatterbrained approach, or, oh, well, let's look at this, let's look at that, so let's try this, let's try that. And I'm actually, to some extent, I think that is a function of what value system you have, but I think it's also actually a, a function of a certain kind of training, a capacity for concentration, a capacity to maintain a sort of calm mind, even especially in difficult situations. And I'm not, I, I suppose maybe I'm even recommending that a little bit of some kind of basic meditation, maybe secular style of mindfulness meditation or something along those lines might actually be part of what you're asking for. Because I think that there is a great tendency in our modern life for there to be things that create this effect of chedusupa, being overwhelmed, of pulling our attention away, seeming to be salient, seeming to be important, but actually they're not. They're just superficial. So in some ways, part of the Buddhist answer here is not at all cognitive. It's really about the development of certain kinds of cognitive capacities for concentration, a stable form of concentration. Thank you, John. Yes, I'd agree. Um, Simon Weil, a French philosopher, said that even a child working on a math problem is a way to increase attention. Paying attention to something, it doesn't have to be prayer, although prayer is an example, but being able to pay attention seriously to solving a math problem can be a lesson in in-depth awareness and uh, uh, attention. It's so rare when we really, really pay attention to something outside ourselves. And I think you're right, the, what the internet has done is to help students gain a tremendous number of connections to different sorts of information. Um, they follow down that path and this path and that path, but they don't go deeply into the center and how to help educationally, especially in light of the computer now, which is going to be in many ways the main way that people read and learn how do we de develop that, that radical attention to the thing itself and to pay attention to it with some depth uh, as another subject, as something important in itself? だから、かそれ。ジョジョジカ。だから、これ。これ。これ。これ。これ。これ。これ。これ。これ。これ。これ。これ。これ。これ。これ。これ。これ。これ。これ。これ。これ。これ。これ。これ。これ。これ。これ
of a particular behavior. But other than that, he's always saying there is not much he has to say. 比如卢克什里啊，你他妈你没点起。And such a casual Tama Tama Jos or Casa Pingoro. So we do see、uh, societal differences in some parts of the world.、Um, the cigarette smoking is taken very seriously, particularly in the public space. So you have important signs, and, and,、uh, and so people modify their behavior accordingly. But then in some countries, there doesn't seem to be that kind of caution. You know, exercise from the pub on the public level, then we see more people smoking. So we see diff societal differences as well. So, so the Hane me Tangdolani, uh, Bonaja, Jingri, yeah, go to Rugutan, Bonaja. So, this shows that there are two ways in which we can, you know, we need to deal with this. One is, of course, the individual self motivation,、uh, and, and then at the same time, there could be a more societal. Kind of, you know,、uh, measures that are taken, you know,、um, so that they can be both ways. Yeah. So, so when we speak about, you know, weighing pros and cons, again, again, we are coming back to the <laughs> point about awareness, <laughs> the role of awareness. Elka, both my presentation and your presentation really dealt with individual action. So I'm wondering, sort of, what、uh, prescription or what diagnosis you know, your framework gives for collective action, where we have to coordinate actions between individuals.、Um, um, yes, it's very true. And generally, if you look at psychology, whether it is contemporary Western psychology or classical Buddhist psychology,、uh, generally they tend to be、uh, kind of, you know, from the perspective of an individual. Because、um, I mean that's the nature of of that particular discipline, and because when we try to take into account the the societal societal impact,、um, social psychology is much more complicated business.、Um, but、um, I mean one of the things, but there is an awareness both in the contemporary psychology and also in the Buddhist psychology of the importance. Important role that、uh, influence that the surrounding and environment exercises upon our behavior,、uh, and、um, so if you look at many of the、uh, instructions in the Buddhist text,、uh, there are constant reminders of that point. Although it was never systematically developed as a, a, a sub sub field of psychology, but the the recognition is there, and here.、Um, Again, in the end,、um, His Holiness always、uh, reminds us that、um, whether we talk about society or community, in the end, the units are individuals. You know, it is individuals, collection of individuals that compose society, that compose community. So,、uh, although、uh, at the emergent level there may be certain properties that the collective display that the individual may not display, but the fact is. A community and uh, um, uh, uh, kind of uh, um, societies and collections of individuals. So the appro Buddhist approach, on the whole, has been to really emphasize the individual approach, so that if the individuals within the collective changes, the collective is naturally going to change. But of course, when it comes to environmental issue, which is the topic of our concern here, then it's much more complicated,、mm. uh, and. And and part of the challenge really comes from the fact that what needs to be done is not that clear, and also、uh, the recommendations that are coming、uh, have huge immediate implications of our, or you know, our behavior and our lifestyle. I remember more than 20 years ago, I had the honor to accompany His Holiness to Germany, and there was soon after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, there was a lot of discussion about the New World Order. And His Holiness was part of a small group of thinkers that spent about two days discussing,、um, you know, this whole question of、uh, emergence of a new world order. And I remember very, very vividly, His Holiness made this very important point. He said, you know, at some point, the affluent Western societies, including Japan and others, really need to take seriously the whole premise of modern economy, where there is a belief in a perpetual growth. Yeah. And the growth is used as a measurement of the success of economy, 
And sooner or later, the people living in the affluent societies will have to learn to somehow bring down their standard of life in terms of consumption. And I remember being very struck because that was one of the very early days I've ever been to the West. I think it was in, you know, fairly early and I was very struck by that. And I think this is increasingly being pointed out in, in one of the constant themes was the problem of consumerism. And we are so used to thinking that this is the way to live. And the governments are so used to assessing their success or failure by using only that you know, measurement. So the question is, how do we change that? And so there needs to be a, a, a movement both from the individual level, but also at this larger uh, societal level as well. I may add one thing. Uh, the material value and I think inner value or spiritual value. Uh, spiritual value. See, we day by day, you see, we use these two values. Hmm. Although, see, we, uh, what's that? What's that? I think most people not knowing fully about this inner value. But, so as I mentioned yesterday, just restful. Uh, of the, Please, just, no. just, of the, relax. No, relax. Uh, so that's the, uh, of course, physical relax also there, but the main thing is mental relax. So everybody is experience the importance of inner value. Hmm. So now here, material value. In any case, there is limitation. Mental inner value, no limitation. Material, there is sort of the physical. Right. So there is limitation. The inner value, no physical. So it's the physical measure, toya kimdua. So then there is nothing to obstruct its further you know, development. Uh, so according to that reality, uh, in material value, it is better practice of contentment because there is in any in way limitation. Limit. Limit. Uh, the inner value is concerned, no limit, so it should not content, but we just opposite. <laughs> uh, inner value, no bother, and content. <laughs> Where actually, so you, we can go infinitely. Yeah, further right. along, oh. far. Ah. Far. Oh, far. But the material value, in any case, there is limitation. We, we always want more, 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 more. Again, this lack of awareness. <laughs> so, you know, a question that I just want to bring out, um, you know, has to do with uh, the lack of contentment of probably everybody in this entire room with regards to what's happening to our Earth and to human beings on our Earth and all, all of the living systems. That lack of contentment, um, I think, is, uh, at least from you know, the perspective of some of us, is really essential. It has to do with the addressing the truth of suffering, the first noble truth that uh, you know, uh, Mathieu was referring to. Um, what about uh, the mandate, is there a mandate within Buddhism to engage directly in social and environmental transformation? To actually, you know, become proactive, um, to, to, you know, uh, deal with the psychosocial and the political issues directly? Or is, are we, you know, taking another approach? Kaza. Solans was saying that uh, when the great Nalanda masters, particularly the 17 who are displayed here, um, um, were alive, of course, the society of India was very, very different from today. So he was, you know, one, you know, we probably need to invite them to come today and then ask their advice. 
Then in the Nang Web Bijan Aroya the sociologists are that you call the thing. So the the point his holiness is making is that if they had written in our age, they would have definitely talked about social sociology and Ranamala the Murjitanala Chizo Pod in the Sudwa. So this is the case to call it the primitive society of Rajas with it. So this said of course in texts such as Ratnavali composed by Nagarjuna in the second century. Um Ranamala. Ratna Ratnamala Mala Vali Ratnavali Mala San Tigor Lao. Ratnamala um which is composed by um Nagarjuna as a letter to king to a king has you know very explicit um sections dealing with the king's responsive social responsibilities to his subjects. Uh, of course his owners were saying that we do have to take into account that he was writing at a time where the social structures were very different and one could also <laughs> say <laughs> <more primitive. laughs> So these kind of texts even have a, a, a scene as a kind of a genre of text referred to as Niti Shastra. How would you translate Niti Shastra? Treaties on norms. Treaties on actually governance. Governance, be better. Treaties on governance. So it's a whole genre of texts. Yeah, so his holiness is well, the, the earlier point that I forgot to translate. Mm. I f didn't finish translating. Is that his his holiness was saying that if these great Nalanda masters were writing today, they would be writing about social issues. So Good. And well, that, I think issues. that's really also, important for us to hear, actually, because um, you know the the prevailing view of a Buddhist practitioner has the, the practitioner being um, you know somewhat uh, individualistic and also somewhat passive. And I think that having an, an engaged perspective is something that, you know, it's a re-articulation or it's a new articulation of Buddhism. And but looking for sources in, you yeah. know, uh, the traditional texts is also helpful. Uh, yes, and I think there are, I just want to say that um, you didn't quite hear the exchange here, but th th there also were mentioned, it's mentioned that there are a number of sutras as well, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. More than one that also consider this. And I, no, we, no one can seem to remember the names precisely, but there are several sutras, actually. And there is a way in which I think uh, a Buddhist version of, you know, social policy, social activism could and be social created. Social responsibility. And social responsibility could be created even now. A sort of vision of that could be created now, in part by looking back to some of those sutras and the and the Rinchen Chengwa and so on. So, that's I think that's probably emerging, perhaps, Your Holiness, in the Buddhist world, a sort of vision of social responsibility. Now that it seems to be part of being within the modern world. Thailand, Burma, the one that you are not even at. But the Jizo quality, ah, the Nangbei, the Cambodian, the Cambodian, the Thai, the Jizo, the one that you are not even at. Ka, ka. So, ka. But the, this one, this one, I mean, what? And Burma, the Thailand, the one that, that one Thailand, which I know, grow more than I see, no good, what? ชีตะวะเกะตะตะชีเนเดนเดเกะชีซุงซุงเซชะเดเกะยอตะเมตะโอ้ตุตุตุกะตุตุจิกะนามเบตะนามเบตะตุตันเจเวนะซุมังซุ
And there's also Sulakshiva Raksha and the Sarvodhya. Prabhasal, Paisan, and uh, of course Ariadne yes. is another person. Yes. And, uh, and in Burma. So and in Burma as well, there's the, what known as the, what's known as the Sarvodhya, the uplift movement that has been very active right. in this way. No, Sri Lanka. In, uh, this is in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, yes. yes. Yeah. Ariadne. Oh, right, mm -hmm. yes. So I s there are some, it's interesting that in the modern Buddhist world, some of this movement has begun. And of course, Thich Nhat Hanh, we're forgetting, has, yes, the an Vietnamese. An important figure in this regard. Yes. You know, taking, in a certain way, of, you know, very radical stance. And, you know, incorporating uh, contemporary ideas uh, into, you know, precepts and into, you know, ordaining of trees or organizing villages and so forth. Mm -hmm. And also the eco-feminist movement in uh, in Some other institution, as a university, some of uh, our university, I think, uh, I think we we'll make plan, uh, organize one sort of conference, uh, and invite from because of the Buddhist, the different Buddhist, Buddhist countries. countries no. I think worthwhile, mm. and then some Western scholars also can participate. I think worthwhile. This what? woman is a suggestion to the vice chancellor of Tibet, Central Tibetan University from Saranath to actually you know, kind of um, organize a conference where uh, speakers from the Buddhist countries, other Buddhist, con Buddhist countries, as well as Western experts, could be invited. Buddhist monastic Dudang Kualia, Denying Azu Chikswavri, International Buddhist Conference Chikswavri. Last year, um, you know, Saranath University hosted an international conference on Buddhist monasticism represented by different monastic communities from uh, different parts of the Buddhist country. Ah. The monastic traditions, uh, yeah. So, the same thing. It's all in this field. all in this field. Something like that would be very beneficial to talk oh. about social responsibility and how do, you know, how do Buddhist communities understand them. Thank you. I think that's a great idea. I, you know, I just, uh, Richie just passed me a, a suggestion. I think it's uh, really uh, important to, to put it out here at this point. He said, in the spirit of integrating the best of the West and Buddhism, why not call for Elke and colleagues to collaborate with Jimpa and Buddhist colleagues to create a blueprint for uh, an environmental social action? I mean, you know, the first stage would be to really identify the movers in the, the Buddhist world, the monastic movers. And then, you know, the second, and to really also articulate clearly the Buddhist principles. And those projects which are directly influenced by Buddhist principles. And then to bring Elke and colleagues um, uh, together in discourse so we can draft an East-West blueprint. Well, and I think certainly uh, as part of His Holiness's proposal here, this could be part of the meeting in Sarnath, in fact, because one of the important questions is not only what's the conception of society and social responsibility and, and the pressing issues around economics and the environment, but also how do we change? What's a B Buddhist vision of not just individual change, but social change. So I think that David could be... David Loy would be a great person. Uh -huh. You know, next week, the interna is the, there's the International Meeting of Engaged Buddhists, and monastics are coming from all over Asia to Bodh Gaya, mm -hmm. to that meeting. I'll be attending and participating mm -hmm. uh, myself. I, maybe you're available to come. I think it would be wonderful. I'll give you the information. <laughs> Good. Charles <laughs> Warwick. あれ、あか。それ、ジリゴマレ、じゃな。よりね。so when we use the word, the dialogue, Buddhism and modern science, uh, and I made correction. This is a wrong word. We are not discussing. Uh, so the, I mean discussion between modern scientists and Buddhists about modern science and Buddhism. No. 
the, you know, no. So in Buddhism, like this, is a lot of explanation about mind, and also not as detailed as the Western sort of kasota, presentation, physicist, the physicist uh, huh? about the particle. Although it's the explanation about the particle also there. So that we can consider as a science which mentioned in Buddhist literature, but it's not Buddhism, just science. Uh, so mind, we are not talking positive and negative. It's just what is that? What's the reality of mind or emotion, these things? So that consider as a science. Uh, then on the basis of the reality, uh, things are momentarily changing uh, and things are interdependent. So on that, on the basis of that reality, Buddhist concept of impermanence, Buddhist concept of emptiness, absence of independent existence, these come on the basis of Buddhist science. But these Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist views, the, so the second uh, the group, group uh, category. Like category. First category, science. Second category, philosophy. The third category, now on the basis of reality, certain concepts develop. On the basis of that, then the practice the, uh, to achieve salvation. That's the Buddhism now. We never discuss with scientists uh, about next life <laughs> or rebirth. I, I, will <laughs> I, I, I will never seek advice uh, from scientists about my next reincarnation. <laughs> <laughs> Either Chinese also, <laughs> no, no Chinese communists. <laughs> so, so these are so Buddhism. This is the business of Buddhist. Uh, the other day I mentioned any religion, no matter how popular, will never be universal. So we are discussing about the whole world. So if we try to Kasuta, seek some answer from Buddhism, it's not right. Uh, there are many different religious traditions. And out of genuine respect, I think we should not create that kind of impression. So I always emphasize, you see, uh, we thinking how much contribution from our tradition, not propagating. So, some knowledge about mind and certain techniques to deal with this destructive emotion, which is mentioned in Buddhism, okay. Take, not as a Buddhist practice, the Buddhist practice must be certain goals, certain destination, right, destination, right? Without that, not Buddhism. Right? When I come to you, I will tell 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 you. For example, to give an example of someone meditating, if the meditation... Samatha, Samatha. Like a, a cultivation of concentration, if it is not uh, um, kind of, you know, motivated by the aspiration to seek liberation, then of course you cannot call that a Buddhist meditation. Chapter, uh, chapter. Uh, sorry, uh, not motivated, uh, not uh, preceded by or, or rooted in taking refuge in the three jewels, then that practice cannot oh. be described as a Buddhist practice. So that kind of practice with the aim, uh, uh, and so uh, the same practice uh, depending upon the goal to which the practice is uh, being engaged in if it is say for example uh, you know taking rebirth in you know kind of high advanced kind of uh, celestial realms of existence then again it doesn't become a Buddhist practice many years ago I heard the Soviet uh, KGB, uh, some small sort of program, is a cultivated Meshi. 
so trying to explore um, if people can cultivate kind of uh, clever ones. Yeah. Oh, for their spy work. <laughs> so neither Hinduism, Buddhism, but simply, you see, a practice of meditation. <laughs> so like that, you see, the certain sort of useful thing, wherever available, take for universal Hasoda. Purpose. Uh, purpose. Okay. So the other kind of study, Buddhism, but the Yawram. So His Holiness is expressing a sense of unease uh. when we characterize what's going on here. It's not so much Buddhism and science, but rather Buddhist science and philosophy on the one side. Science, science. which mentioned in Buddhist, Buddhist literature, literature or Buddhist tradition. Hmm. So? John? Well, if there's time, I would ask one question to Your Holiness, which is, I, I've uh, heard you say this before about the relationship between Buddhist science and Buddhist philosophy, and I think it's a very useful way to understand our dialogue, but I do think sometimes, I wonder a couple of things, Your Holiness, that if you could comment on them before we end. Um, when uh, we think of the idea, for example, the philosophical idea of interdependence, it seems actually to have a very important relationship to how we do science. And it took Western science quite a long time to come to the point of view where interdependence is the nature of reality. And I'm wondering whether that's because there wasn't a philosophical tradition in Europe that really strongly upheld the notion of interdependence. Whereas if there were great physicists in the Buddhist world, perhaps that kind of a notion of an interdependent reality would have come up earlier. So perhaps when I, part of what I'm asking, Your Holiness, is what you see the role of philosophy and ideas around interdependence in the dialogue with scientists might play. Is, do these play an important role in changing the way we do science? Changing education is another thing. So of course, uh, when engaging in discussion with scientists, the concept of Origination by means of dependence is in a, that's a concept that constantly comes up. Oh. Mm -hmm. yes. But oh, on the other yes. hand, if you are talking about dependent origination in terms of emergence of concepts mm. which are thoroughly contingent and dependent, then that is a concept not even all the Buddhists subscribe mm -hmm. to anyway. Yes. Oh. Mm. Only mm. oh. So, for the time being, that's also not relevant. In the quality, temper, temper, the pingry. She has a big jazz at Jenny with the daughter Jenny, money we could do, and on the quantum physics, jazz at the Jacques Mani, we could do, yeah, that means losing some little disorder. That material philosophy, don't attend that was at the end of the world. There are, there could be areas where even that level of Buddhist understanding of dependent origination can you know, make a contribution. So for example, in the quantum physics, as a result of very, you know, minute analysis, at some point for some quantum physicists, their notion of reality mm -hmm. breaks down, and then which could lead to a kind of a nihilistic position that nothing really exists. So in these kind of situations, the, uh, the, the middle way philosophies, kind of, you know, characterization of reality in terms of radical dependence it can be a helpful contribution. Thank you, Your Holiness, Thank you. so much. Well.